Hello. Good evening. Good morning and good afternoon, dear vascular surgeon, hematology and radiology doctors all over the universe. On behalf of the Egyptian Venus Forum, I am honored to welcome you all to the Russian Egyptian Forum. It's a great chance to join our dear Russian vascular surgeons and share our experience, knowledge, and make it in a very nice platform, interactive with our colleagues from Egypt and dear friends from Russia, and introduce whatever you can enjoy. And it is a very good chance to ask dear attendees to share and interact with us. I'd like to thank Sigveris Group for sponsoring this forum. And it is nice to start our work with MOH. This is very non-profit program, sharing experience and education along the universe. Uh, thank you. And I am honored to introduce my dear Professor Avenji Shaitakov, the President of National College of Philobology of Russia. Please, Professor Shaitakov. Uh, unmute, unmute the voice, please, Professor Shaitakov. Unmute your voice. Okay. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, uh, dear guests, uh, uh, on behalf of National College of the Bologna, Russia, uh, I would like to, but I'm sure that we continue in the nearest Евгений Владимирович, вас не слышно? Не слышно. Сейчас слышно? Сейчас слышно. Хорошо. С интернетом, интернет тормозил. Да, немножко тормозил. Dear guests, dear colleagues and friends, a rapid and considerable progress in phlebology during the past decades has formally joined specialist practice in an almost all areas of medicine. Moving from the simple to complex, from basic concepts to brilliant ideas, we are getting absorbed by molecular and genetic mechanism of venous pathology. And the venous laser and radio frequency ablation that emerged at the dawn of the 21st century to gracefully eliminate the pathological superficial reflux are complemented today by the foam foam steam ablation and novel glue based techniques. Open thrombectomies, cathetic direct thrombolysis, pharmacomechanical thrombolysis have been associated with the markedly improved outcomes in patients with an extensive activity. Certain surgical approach of alleviate post thrombotic syndrome, including percutaneous angioplasty and stenting of the iliofemoral segments, as well as restoration of the valvular function of deep veins, demonstrated promising long term results. Do you think there is anything to unite all these methods? We told, of course, it's our friendship. Uh, I believe won't the Drees from the truth by saying that it seems to be a rational conservative therapy at all steps of treatment from symptoms elevation to cutting edge surgical technologies. Despite the obvious success, however, we often remain dissatisfied by the results. Dear friends, we try to include uh, to our program the best presentation of our modern 
uh, new uh, uh, presentation, more than new uh, doctors uh, from Russia and from Egypt. So enjoy uh, our communication, enjoy our first Russian Egypt Venus Forum. Thank you, Professor Shaidakov, for this very nice uh, introduction. Thank you. And uh, very nice welcome speech. Now I am honored <coughs> to introduce Professor Mohammed Al Maadawi, Professor of Vascular Surgery, Cairo University, is going to talk about Venus stenting from theory to practice, single center experience. Welcome, welcome everybody. Please uh, turn to my uh, shared screen. Yes, is it clear for everyone? Yes, I uh, I would like to uh, thank the committee for uh, their. Uh, generous invitation uh, uh, to me uh, today, and I, I hope I could be of, of value for every audience. Uh, we have to know uh, something about uh, the uh, Venus uh, stenting, uh, which should be summarized as follows in the few uh, slides. Uh, uh, the knowledge and the experience applied to the arteries cannot be translated to the vein. Uh, because as you know, the arteries are different, the veins and the structure, functions and diameters, hemodynamics as well add their response to the parotrauma. Uh, uh, also, we have a fewer studies are done on the veins uh, compared to those uh, of the arteries, maybe due to uh, reluctance of uh, the uh, surgeons to perform uh, uh, this uh, 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 research over, uh, over, over, uh, over there. Uh, because uh, somewhat to the fund and somewhat to uh, they uh, do not uh, they rely on uh, the well uh, tested uh, conservative treatments in the venous uh, diseases the idea venous stent should uh, uh, offer us the following functions should convey the blood from the periphery to the heart and also balance the blood volume as it acts as a, a, a blood reservoir used uh, in necessary and also it uh, balances the pressure within the organs as uh, well. For that, the venous scent should uh, be characterized by higher radio force than that of uh, the arteries in order to compensate for the lower uh, pressure from inside in order to oppose the external pressure, both focal like in case of the Turner syndrome or in case of the uh, global uh, uh, compression from outside uh, by the fibrosis in the uh, wall of the vein as a result of uh, occlusion. Also it should uh, provide us with uh, uh, a higher flexibility and higher uh, compliance in order to accommodate the changes in the vein diameter. As we know, uh, there is doubling of the diameter of the uh, axillary vein and the, the inferior vena cava uh, during certain phases of respiration. Uh, uh, to avoid the, the vein wall reactions by the rigid the stent uh, this uh, uh, venous stent should be flexible as uh, well in order to avoid the unexpected stenosis and or angulation that uh, could develop between the stented vein segment and the unstented uh, uh, vein. A study examining the long-term results of the venous stents are unfortunately are inconsistent and many are uh, irreconcilable and uh, contradictory. A few results are waiting and a few of them have been published uh, up to now. Uh, uh, also, unfortunately, uh, no FDA approval for any of the commercially available venous stent except recently the Bard Venova and the uh, Veneti Viki stent. Uh, when we perform uh, this uh, venous stenting uh, for the various causes, we usually we use use general and this is really convenient to the patient and also there is a recruitment of huge number of nerve endings that the pain of the vein dilatation could not be tolerated by the patient. Uh, so buying position serves uh, us uh, a lot because we uh, usually, as I have said, uh, many uh, uh, or more than uh, one access uh, to accomplish our mission. 
uh, uh, usually we, we use uh, multiple excesses because it is better to have these multiple excesses before you give the patient full dose of anticoagulant. Also, it allows you to have a better crossing. Sometimes you cannot cross a lesion if you come from above from the internal jugular vein, and the, the same lesion could be crossed if you come from uh, the femoral vein. Uh, also, it provides you with a, 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 a contrast-free road map because it will define your target point you want to go uh, to through the extensive collaterals, as uh, we will see. Also, it uh, provides you with the through and through, and the, its advantage will be elucidated later on. Uh, here, uh, you uh, can see this is, is coming from above, and this is coming from below. This one missed the, the target lesions, but the, our target lesions is on that, on that way. Uh, engagement, uh, in order to engage uh, in uh, the uh, affected parts, uh, particularly if it is an occlusive part, you have uh, to exploit the anatomical landmarks and respecting the anatomical variation, tolerating the extensive collaterals in which the wire tends to go. This is an example of the uh, ascending lumbar vein. For the first uh, uh, glimpse at uh, that, you may find that this uh, wire uh, had uh, perforated the vein. Actually, it is not. If you can see the stump of this ascending lumbar vein, and uh, it is more, uh, the stump becomes bigger in next uh, image. And uh, this is after we uh, realigned ourselves into the inferior vena cava. This is textbook illustrations of the ascending lum lumbar vein, how it uh, looks in textbooks. Uh, Sometimes we uh, do a contrast uh, angiography through the puncture uh, needle and the parts of the two uh, cross uh, our lesion. Uh, in, in, in that way, this is the uh, wire goes into the intercostal, uh, intercostal vein and missed the uh, site we want to go uh, through. This is after the BTA and the correct position of our wire. Uh, here is uh, the uh, 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 cross, crosses from one side to uh, the other side. And in such instances, we uh, had uh, uh, gotten perforation inside this, uh, uh, but this is uh, not a triple sum because it, uh, its effect is a puncture of a peripheral vein. Here is another illustration. So you, uh, we, we went through that uh, site and we go all through through the internal uh, mammary vein and we find ourselves into the opposite side. This is called the substernal osmosis and, and I found it into the illustration of the textbooks. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, we couldn't uh, cross uh, the lesion uh, in uh, that uh, patient. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, it comes to the crossing the lesion, Synotic lesions are easiest to cross. Comes next is the acute thro uh, thrombosis, which is easier to cross than the chronic obstruction, in which case the uh, vein uh, uh, turns to be a fibrotic uh, structure with micro channels only inside, if any. Uh, here, in the, uh, during uh, the crossing, this part was difficult and the, the other part is clear as we see. Uh, also, we use uh, the uh, jugular femoral through and through uh, wire because it gives you the uh, regist, uh, regist, uh, uh, rail mail in order to increase the possibility of your instrument across uh, uh, difficult lesions. Uh, uh, balloon angioplasty is performed by large diameter balloons at higher uh, pressure than uh, you use in uh, the arteries. Uh, Sometimes we compensate for the unavailability of a big diameter balloon uh, by uh, applying the uh, double balloon uh, technique, putting it side by side uh, in order to uh, dilate uh, the lesions. The blurring stent, usually we go from uh, the normal to uh, normal, and in cases of the multiple stent, usually we uh, perform the uh, overlap. Uh, uh, one centimeter or slightly more. I also found that the over the contralateral the common iliac vein is somewhat safe. It is not absolutely safe, but it is somewhat safe. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, uh, one of our uh, cases as we deploy the stent. And this is the check angiogram. It should be performed after every step in order to see where uh, you are. Uh, unfortunately, contrast induced nephropathy is low as compared to the artery, and nobody knows why. Low in the venous cases. This is the completion angiogram of the case before. This is the excessive dilatations here uh, will involute over time, and it represents the. This is a case uh, uh, who was a male patient, 38 years old, developed uh, left iliofemoral DVT for you before uh, his presentation with venous ulcer resistant to heal. The DVT was provoked by surgery uh, for varicose veins on the same limb. Uh, as for the detailed procedure, this is the scavenged angiogram through the uh, common femoral uh, common femoral vein. Yes, this is the iliac are occluded, and this is the uh, corkscrew-like uh, collateral vein conveying the blood from that side to the opposite uh, side. This is another scout angiogram from above, uh, denoting the presence of uh, the exact uh, site of the lesion. Again, our wire goes into the ascending lumbar vein and the target lesions, as uh, you see here. We realign this uh, uh, wire into the uh, correct uh, passage that it uh, should uh, go through, as, uh, as you see here. Let me repeat it again. Yes, this is IVC and this is the, our catheter which uh, comes from above. Uh, we conf usually we should confirm the crossing of the lesion into the patent uh, unaffected vessel, in such cases the inferior vena cava. And uh, we found that we have successfully crossed the lesion as you see. Here the balloon angioplasty comes from central to Peripheral, as you see, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, got perforation of the vein here, as evidenced by the extravasation of the dye, as you see. This is extravasation of the dye. In such cases, we inflate the balloon there in order to tamponade the perforation, but here, the inflated balloon missed the site of the perforation and wasn't, uh, uh, it was ineffective. We repeated the procedure to make uh, that everything is okay and the balloon is effectively tamponading the site of the occlusion as you see. And after we left it uh, there for five minutes, we had performed check angiogram. It's clear there is no extravasation of the contrast material. That's to say the perforation has been sealed. Deploy the stent, the central one first, followed by the peripheral, followed by the peripheral one. Here, the distal stent, making the overlap of uh, one or slightly more than one centimeter, as you see. And this is the post dilatation. Here the completion angiogram after we free flow of the dye inside of the IVC. And this dye uh, came from below, not from, uh, from above. Uh, this is the uh, photo of the ulcer uh, immediately after the procedure. And this is 
uh, two weeks after the procedure with a marked improvement and a somewhat healthy granulation tissue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mohammed. It was a very nice uh, presentation. And thank you for keeping the uh, time. It was great. Now uh, I will ask uh, Professor Alex Fuxin, uh, the Vice President of National College of Lipology of Russia, to present his uh, question. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Good afternoon for everyone. My question devote to uh, antithrombotic therapy after stenting. Uh, what um, uh, medical remedies and duration of antithrombotic therapy? Uh, yes, uh, uh, some uh, some of the cases there is no uh, argument about giving uh, them uh, anticoagulant therapy. Who are patients suffering from thrombophilia? Uh, the patients, other than the thrombophilic patients, there is a controversy about that. Uh, we, usually, we uh, give this, this uh, patient uh, three months of full dose of anticoagulant. Uh, uh, followed uh, by a uh, prophylactic dose for two years. Uh, the proponents for that is uh, you uh, uh, want this uh, venous uh, stent to establish itself and uh, you want to guard yourself against the trauma you have inflicted during uh, uh, performing this uh, stenting. Uh, and uh, I, uh, we, we, we have no problems for this uh, prolonged period of time of anticoagulants in such patients. Thank you, and thank you very much for Mohammed for best nice presentation. Thank very you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, Dr. Omar, do you have the questions from the attendees? Yes, uh, we have quite a few questions. I will take one from them to Professor Maddawi. They said, Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Uh, in case of perforation, how can you handle this situation of extravasation other than long inflation of balloon over five minutes? What if this didn't work? What would you do next? Uh, the next, you can repeat it once more. This is... This is time, and during that period, you should take a uh, 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 time in order to see if there is an uh, excessive anticoagulation given to the patient. If after this repetition, you find that there is still extravasation of the contrast material, you have no choice uh, other than to put covered stent in such an instance. Okay. Well, is there any experience of putting peripheral coil at the site of perforation? Or have you faced this situation before? Usually, I do. I I I I, I do not, and the others do not uh, use laterally uh, coils in the veins because of the uh, uh, possibilities, high risk of uh, central to to, to make a, a pulmonary uh, embolism. We can implies uh, to uh, to the lung. But if you want to, I, I, I don't uh, do that. But if, if I want, I would recommend to make them made inside this. So I do put the stage first. Okay, Professor Mohammed Maadawi, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it is time now for the first poll. Yes, um, yes, thank okay. you. Sir. Our first polling, Mr. Khalid. It's a very interesting poll, and I will uh, pronounce it. How, how important applying compression stocking post stenting? Is it highly important, medium important, or low important? So uh, please submit your answer, and it usually takes 60 seconds to... Um, to show the result, and the mic is back to you, Professor Ayman. Thank you, Omar, and uh, it was very nice. Uh, till we have uh, 
the answer of the bowling, and uh, I can introduce uh, Professor Karl Lopastov, uh, Bergov, Russian National Research uh, Medical University, and he's a member of Council of National College of Phlebology of Russia. Professor Karl is going to speak about how to avoid post-thrombotic syndrome after deep venous thrombosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ayman. Uh, colleagues, uh, good evening. Uh, here, uh, this is the answer. Uh, Omar, you can comment for the answer, please, before... Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the answer is very, very interesting. It showed that there is a high, high uh, practice for using compression uh, immediately after stenting, uh, around 70% of the attendees. That is very, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ayman. Sorry for the interruption, uh, Dr. Curl. Now you can uh, start your uh, great speech. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to discuss uh, the prevention of the post-thrombotic syndrome. So the pre previous presentation was about uh, the treatment uh, of uh, uh, occlusions, uh, post-thrombotic occlusion of the deep vein. And uh, uh, it is important to know if we can avoid uh, this uh, problem uh, and uh, uh, avoid uh, such uh, complications that uh, could be uh, found after such interventions. Uh, so this is my disclosure. And uh, we all know that uh, the deep vein thrombosis, uh, it is established incidence. And in Russia, we have also some kind of uh, official statistics. As you can see, it is uh, accounted a little bit uh, more than the uh, international data, about 1.5, 1.6 cases per 1,000 person years. And uh, uh, we know that post-thrombotic syndrome occurs in about half of the patients uh, who uh, developed uh, proximal deep vein thrombosis, uh, and uh, it may be up to 90% of the patients uh, who developed uh, the iliac vein thrombosis. So it's uh, really a very important medical and social problem, uh, and it is uh, uh, essential to know uh, how to avoid it. Uh, for the uh, diagnosis of a post-thrombotic syndrome for today, we use the Villalta score, and you know that it is a combination of five symptoms and six clinical signs, uh, which are ranged uh, from uh, zero to three scores, and uh, the total amount of the score allows you uh, to uh, establish uh, the post-thrombotic syndrome. However, it is very sensitive uh, uh, for the post-thrombotic syndrome, but the specificity is very low. And uh, the recent studies show that uh, uh, the PTS could be misdiagnosed in about half of the patients. So uh, if the patient has a pre-existing chronic venous disease, for example, very cold veins, some swelling, some pain in the leg, and uh, he uh, developed a deep pain thrombosis, and six months after, he also feels uh, the same pain, the same uh, edema, and the same varicose veins. But however, if you are calculating the Villalta score, you can uh, classify this patient as having post-thrombotic syndrome. But however, it is not a post-thrombotic syndrome because it is the previous chronic venous disease that he had had uh, before this thrombosis. This is the main problem of the uh, Villalta score. And uh, however, we have uh, no other established and uh, uh, verified uh, instruments uh, to uh, diagnosis classification and uh, 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 assessing of the severity for the post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, so for today, we know uh, the several risk factors uh, of the post-thrombotic syndrome and uh, their uh, influence on the uh, risk of the developing of this disease is different. You can find the odds ratio for all these factors. And uh, I will follow all these uh, factors and try to uh, find uh, some evidence uh, to uh, removing these factors uh, to avoid the post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, so the first risk factor it is the ipsilateral DVT recurrence. So it's the recurrence of the DVT on the same leg uh, uh, that uh, was uh, treated before. Of course, it is the uh, most important risk factors. And uh, if it appears, it uh, increases the risk up to 10 times of uh, the post-thrombotic syndrome. And then we can uh, suggest two ways to avoid it. Uh, first, it is the surgical removal of the thrombus because we have some very interesting data that uh, if we uh, make uh, the good uh, catheter thrombolysis or uh, the good uh, surgical thrombectomy or pharmacomechanical thrombolysis and remove more than 50% of all thrombus, the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome will be only 5%. But if we, will, uh, if we are not able to remove more than 50% of uh, the old thrombotic burden, in this situation, the incidence of post-thrombotic uh, syndrome may be 50%. So, this, so it is 10 
times higher and uh, of course trying to remove most part of the thrombus especially in, from the proximal veins from the iliac veins uh, it is essential to avoid the thrombotic syndrome uh, the other uh, i think it is uh, uh, the sequence uh, of the developing uh, uh, recurrent DVT and uh, the post-thrombotic syndrome. If you look at uh, these uh, two curves, uh, you can find that uh, they are really similar. So uh, that uh, the cumulative incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome increases with the increase of uh, uh, the uh, recurrence of the deep vein thrombosis. And uh, 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 to avoid uh, the DVT recurrence, uh, we need uh, to give to the patient adequate anticoagula uh, anticoagulation for the a reasonable time and the duration of anticoagulation it is a very important uh, uh, issue and uh, here you can find the uh, recent guidelines uh, from the European Society of Cardiologists uh, and uh, you can see that only uh, uh, venal thromboembolism that was provoked by the major reversible factor like uh, major trauma with plaster casts like major surgery only such kind of events need to be treated for three months and after that you can stop the anticoagulation all other situations you can prolong the anticoagulation treatment uh, for more than three months to the uh, um, identified time so it is very important to give uh, to the patient adequate uh, uh, anticoagulation for the reasonable time the vein ball inflammation is as a part of the thrombotic syndrome, the migration of the leukocytes are through the thrombus into the vein ball and uh, uh, providing some lesion of the vein ball. It's also uh, linked uh, to the uh, uh, structural changes and uh, uh, can uh, reduce the venous wall tone as well as residual venous obstruction. It is also the uh, factor uh, for the development of PTS. And uh, uh, there we can find some uh, drugs uh, which are potential, uh, which had the potential activity against the inflammatory process in the venous wall and it may be statins and the, uh, in PFF. And uh, Micronize, it's a purified flavonoid fraction. We studied it in uh, one small pilot uh, trial and find out that if the patient uh, was treated with MPFF for 12 months in addition to rivaroxaban and compression stockings. In this situation, uh, uh, we can find uh, the uh, significant uh, decrease in the incidence of uh, post syndrome. You can see uh, that it was uh, only 13%, again 53%. And uh, uh, what is most important, uh, it was uh, the um, more uh, uh, complete and more fast recognition of the deep veins, uh, so the thrombotic burden uh, was decreased. Uh, 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 better. And uh, uh, what is more important, it is uh, the progression of the chronic venous disease, the uh, transition of the uh, lower uh, seed clinical class to the higher seed clinical class was found only in one patient who was treated by MPFF and in 10 patients who were not treated with MPFF. So it's uh, stopped the progression of the uh, chronic venous disease. And so maybe uh, this criteria is more specific for the post-thrombotic syndrome that uh, the Delta score. Uh, the proximal localization of DVT is another risk factor since there we can find only one method to uh, 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 remove it. It is a surgical thrombus removal uh, and uh, we know the uh, unfavorable uh, results of the ATRAC trial. Everybody knows it. Uh, uh, it was not able to uh, reduce the incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome, but however, the incidence of uh, uh, moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome was decreased uh, in parallel with increase of uh, the risk for major bleeding. But however, ATRAC trial, it was not very uh, good trial because uh, the technical success uh, was only uh, 76 percent and uh, there was a low rate of the balloon angioplasty and uh, very low uh, rate of the venous tanking uh, the, st the uh, treatment of the underlying uh, uh, condition uh, and uh, uh, the uh, residual uh, venous obstruction. And uh, now what is important, they included uh, the patients with femoral popliteal deep vein thrombosis who may not benefit from the uh, thrombolysis or uh, pharmacomechanical thrombolysis. And uh, the duration of the anticoagulation therapy was uh, also uh, not uh, uh, adequate. Most patients uh, stopped their anticoagulation at uh, three or six months, and there was a high rate of uh, DVT recurrence, what, uh, which also made it the reason for this uh, unfavorable uh, outcomes. Uh, however, the uh, uh, further meta-analysis, which included the results of the ATRAC trial, they still shows us that uh, uh, the risk of PTS may be reduced by 35% by uh, mechanical uh, thrombectomy, pharmacomechanical thrombectomy, and catheter-directed thrombolysis. 
Uh, age, it is uh, the risk factor which we can not influence uh, so unfortunately obesity you understand that it is a diet and physical exercises and the pre-existing chronic venous disease may be uh, controlled by the elastic compression there is a very important role of the elastic compression and uh, we also had a not very good trial the SOX trial which was published in 2014 and it showed that uh, there is no benefits uh, of the elastic compression stockings but however there was also a very important methodological limitations and uh, the most important it is uh, that they started uh, elastic compression very late about at one week after randomization and uh, the patient did not receive any compression in the acute phase in the phase of acute edema and it was a, a very low compliance about 70 percent of patients had uh, uh, used uh, the compression stockings for three days a week and more. So it's not a treatment, it's just uh, using the socks uh, for three days a week. So it's not a very good compliance. But however, the more recent trials, they showed that elastic compression uh, can prevent the post thrombotic syndrome. And that one of them, it is the ideal DVT study. It showed a very important issue that if you start the compression with the compression stocking, so uh, with the compression bandage during the first week after uh, the patient was admitted with a deep pain thrombosis, you can reduce the most important symptom, symptoms of the post-thrombotic syndrome like skin induration, hyperpigmentation, venectasia, and puff pain uh, on calf compression. So these components of the uh, the Lalta score. And uh, uh, it is uh, really uh, essential to start the compression stroking in the beginning of the disease. And this may be the key uh, point uh, for the uh, preventing of PTS. Uh, the non-adequate anticoagulation, again, it is uh, one of the problem and it is uh, 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 related to the vitamin K antagonists, uh, first of all, and the direct oral anticoagulants for today, they can avoid such um, a problem. And we uh, uh, have uh, some data that particularly uh, rivaroxaban, uh, when it was compared with the vitamin K antagonists, it showed the reduced uh, risk of the post thrombotic syndrome and improved recognition of the deep veins, which allowed to avoid uh, PTS. So uh, we can prefer the talks, particularly rivaroxaban uh, in such kind of patients. And uh, the last uh, I uh, think it is a residual venous obstruction. We need uh, to remove all the residual thrombus if we made a surgical thrombotomy. And uh, that was also demonstrated in one trial by Anthony Camerota. He showed that if the residual thrombus was more than 50%, uh, uh, these patients had a higher risk of PTS development and the higher the Lauta score compared with those who had uh, a good uh, lysis, a good uh, removing of the old uh, thrombotic masses uh, from uh, their veins. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, I would like uh, to summarize uh, all this data and suggest that for uh, iliofemoral DVT, we should prefer the effective, I would, I would like to stress your attention that it should be effective catheter director thrombolysis, pharmacomechanical thrombolysis or surgical thrombotomy. And uh, uh, we should always suggest the treating of the underlying lesion like uh, uh, residual venous obstruction and uh, uh, non-thrombotic venous obstruction. For the femoral popliteal DVT, we can make uh, uh, some uh, enhanced therapy with the MPFF, for example, as we showed in our trial. And for any DVT, the early start of elastic compression stockings is essential. The uh, 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 using of directoral anticoagulants over VKA, the long-term anticoagulation and reducing of body weight uh, if it is increased is also very important. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I would uh, uh, like to uh, answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Lobostov, for a very, 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 very nice uh, illustrated uh, lecture. And thank you for keeping uh, for time. And now I am honored to announce Professor Ahmeddin Hussain, Professor of Vascular Surgery in Shams University. Uh, professor Ahmed, uh, you can put your question, please. Hello, I'm, is my voice heard? Yes, perfect. Thank you, sir. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Lovostov. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great presentation and you have touched base on so many important issues. Uh, with the, your permission, uh, Dr. Ayman, uh, I have a tiny comment and then my question. Um, the comment is that um, as you nicely exposed, uh, uh, Dr. Kirill, uh, the um, uh, 
um, different risk factors for developing uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, I think uh, one of the major points to avoid post-thrombotic syndrome is to have a high index of clinical suspicion, especially uh, in case of uh, non-resolution of uh, symptoms following the first episode of DVT after one month. Uh, I hope you agree about that. Um, and uh, now my question is, um, who are the candidate uh, patients for deep vein imaging? Uh, supposedly, you are having a patient with post-thrombotic syndrome and venous ulcer, which, which denotes an underlying not only reflux, but also obstruction. So uh, who are the candidate patients for deep vein imaging? Thank you very much. So you mean uh, uh, imaging like uh, CT angiography, MRI angiography? Yes, so or, they... M uh, or MR venography, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I assume that uh, these are also the same patients who are uh, fulfilling the criteria for deep vein interventions. Yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, uh, usually such uh, 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 additional uh, imaging tests uh, uh, which uh, uh, provide us information on the iliac veins, uh, uh, they are uh, essentially if we plan some kind of uh, uh, venous reconstruction and uh, of course the patients uh, with uh, the progressive uh, 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 chronic venous insufficiency like uh, trophic ulcers, like uh, uh, trophic uh, skin changes, uh, uh, they uh, need uh, such uh, investigations uh, to find out the reason of uh, these changes and uh, to find out uh, the uh, uh, opportunities uh, to uh, make some intervention to uh, treat these uh, lesions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Omar, do you have questions from uh, the attendees? Yes, yes, we have a question. Uh, thank you very much for a great uh, lecture, Professor Kirill. He asked about, uh, you recommended use graduated, graduated compression stocking in PTS syndrome. Is there is any specific indication of which degree of compression do you prefer? Is it 20 millimeter mercury 15? Or what is the guideline for this? Is grade two, three, or four? What is the best from your experience? Thank you very much. Yes, it's uh, really very important because all the trials uh, on the uh, compression stockings in uh, preventing PTS, uh, they used uh, uh, the uh, grade three. So it is from 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so these uh, uh, stockings uh, should be used uh, uh, in practice. Excellent. And uh, let me take this great opportunity to introduce a very dear brother and a very eminent vascular surgeon, uh, well known all over the world after such a successful webinar. My dearest, Professor Ayman Fakhri, we got used to his good morning, good afternoon, and good evening over the last six months. And we enjoyed all his webinar. He is the president of the Egyptian Philobology Society, which have actually been initiated 15 years ago, so he definitely have a vision that uh, this Venus Society will be, um, will be prosperous in 2020. He have a huge connection, especially with Russian colleague, because he spent a lot of uh, uh, his journeys between Russia and uh, between Denis Borisk and a lot of his friends in the, in the Russian society, and we welcome them all. And I would like to welcome our, uh, our big star in Egypt, Professor Ayman Fakhri, for his great presentation, which is titled The Microwave Ablation of Varicose Vein of the Lower Limb, Early Egyptian Result. And I would just announce that he is the first one to use microwave ablation in the Middle East. Professor Ayman. Thank you, Professor Omar, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it very well. Okay. Uh, as you said, I am going to discuss microwave ablation of varicose veins, early Egyptian experience. I don't have nothing to disclose. Uh, in contents of the saphenofemoral junction, is the most common cause about 70% of viruses 
NICE guidelines recommended thermal ablation at the first line of treatment of varicose veins. Microwave ablation has all the advantages of radio frequency ablation and latest laser fiber. And in addition, it does not become in contact with the vein wall and it acts on the water within the cells of the vessel wall. The first case was performed on February 2019 by Marquette in London. And uh, we started our series only six months after him. The uh, objective of our study today is providing the safety and the efficacy of microwave catheter ablation in treatment of varicose veins of the lower limb. We uh, recruited 10 patients admitted to Royal Vascular Center from August 1st, 2019 to December 30, 2019 with primary varicose veins uh, ranged from C2 to 5 of great softness vein. All were treated by microwave ablation of the great softness vein, duplex guided and using ambulant amount of tumescent anesthesia. All patients had subjected to careful clinical exam, duplex evaluation, and signed their informed medical consent. The primary endpoint was anatomical and clinical uh, success at one month follow up. And the secondary endpoint our technical success. This is uh, our machine. This is the echo uh, generator of the microwave, and it is connected to the syringe bump of uh, getting the tumescent anesthesia with just a bedroom. And as you see, this is the catheter. This is the microwave catheter. It is very soft malleable and it goes easily through the vein. All patients treated by the microwave catheter, we go very close to the saphenofemoral junction using ambulant amount of tumescent anesthesia. First of all, as we all did, we mark the patient and drive it, drive him, put, we insert the seven French uh, sheath then introduce the microwave catheter with the doublex guidance. We came here, as you see, very close. This is the great softness and this is the deep, uh, and this is the femoral vein. We go very close to the saphenovemoral junction. And as you see, when we burn or start ablation of the vein, no forward propagation of the thermal wave. It is just down and backward. No forward propagation. So it is very safe to use it very close to the deep veins with no, without fear of ablating or inducing venous thrombosis. Uh, patient age was about 35.4 and male to female ratio was 64. The dominance was of the left lower limb, which is isolated left was on six, one patient on the right, and both lower limbs and three patients. As you see, this is the measurement, and we got this is the measurement at the mid thigh, at the calf region, at, at and the ankle, and uh, hopefully we got significant decrease in all measures after one month was significant decrease and uh, it was very nice. The great, uh, the great softness vein diameter was about, uh, the mean was about 12 millimeter. It is, it is some, somewhat a big vein and the duration of relax was about 0.5 to 0.7 seconds. Again, this is our results after immediate after ablation and one month later, we didn't uh, get any resistance of reflux, we got 100% success, and the duration of uh, the procedure was about 40 minutes. It is a quick procedure. Uh, the most important that patients uh, returned to work after only three days, full active, 
and with the range from two to five days. Again, very important, the, uh, the preoperative pain dropped from, uh, dropped from nine to about three. The preoperative pain dropped dramatically from nine to three. And Venus clinical severity score also dropped from 10.7 to six, uh, to 7.6, which was significant. The take home message regarding the technical tips, it is a quick procedure. It uh, takes about uh, 40 minutes. It is the same procedure. We can go uh, very close to the uh, suffering uh, to the femoral vein without fear of uh, getting an injurious effect. And it is applicable technique. We did it in many patients, and uh, the most important, you can use it in uh, big uh, veins. Patient preference, as you see, it, it, there was improvement in the preoperative pain and uh, decrease in the venous clinical severity score. And it is cost effective as our patients went to their work within three days. To conclude uh, uh, our Dear friends, microwave catheter ablation is a safe and effective method in treatment of varicose veins with expected lower recurrence rate and fewer complications than laser or radio frequency ablation of varicose vein. Before I uh, leave, I want to invite you all to visit us in Luxor. Uh, join us in Asia Vest 2020 from 10th to 13th December. Please come and join uh, us. And this is our great monument. This, represent, this represents the Russian-Egyptian friendship. It is present in Aswan, very close to the Hayden. Thank you, and uh, I enjoy uh, talking to you. Okay. Thank you very much to Professor Ayman. That was great. And thank you very much for sticking to time because even if you take a long time, I wouldn't be able to do anything because you are the president <laughs> of the Philobology Society. And let me introduce one of the most eminent uh, Russian philobologists, uh, Professor Elina Boliva. Uh, she is a member of the Council of the National College of Philobology, Russia, and also a representative of the National College of Philobology and the well-known name in philobology research. If you like um, uh, to... Um, um, ask any question to Professor Ayman, Professor Elena. Yeah, colleagues, do you hear me? Yeah, here yeah. or not? No, we can hear you very well and we can see you very well too. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, we can hear you now. Professor Fekri, thank you for your great lecture. And I have one question for you. Uh, it's known uh, that uh, endovascular procedure of veins uh, are performed uh, at different vein diameters uh, from five millimeters to 20 millimeters and what's your opinion uh, what is optimal vein diameter for effective micro microwave ablation and uh, can we use uh, this ablation for very close tributaries of great softness vein without burn skin Okay, thank you. This is a very good question. And uh, you touched a very important point. You are asking about the diameter of the vein, how uh, it is effective in treating different diameter of vein. Yes, you have a point. Uh, as you know, from laser and the radio frequency, uh, there is a somewhat limitation of vein. Uh, it is very effective up to 12 millimeter, 14 millimeter. After that, it, you can repeat the procedure two and three times. But using uh, microwave, you can accommodate up to 25 millimeter diameter. It can work from just one ablation. As the microwave go, acts on the uh, water within the cells of uh, uh, the vessel. So it can act dramatically on whatever the size of the vein up to 25 millimeter, but the best results achieved in treating vein from uh, six to 
14 millimeter. This is the best results. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thank Professor. You. Thank you. And uh, we have um, a question from one of the eminent vascular surgeons in Russia, uh, Professor Alexei Nadikov. His question is very interesting. He said, what is the advantage of microwave over laser and the radio frequency? What is the benefit that this technique adds? Yes. Uh, thank you. This is a very nice procedure. Yes, it has uh, three main advantages. Up to my little experience, uh, it can act on bigger side of the vein safely. It can act on very close to the saphenofemoral junction safely. Uh, uh, and it is a quick procedure because uh, the catheter, uh, the pull away uh, the technique is faster. You, you don't want to make it half centimeter or half centimeter. It, it make it uh, about three to four centimeter in one uh, time. And uh, you don't want to repeat the procedure. So the mean time to do the procedure from A to Z, it takes about 40 minutes. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Ayman. Uh, you did put it in a nutshell. And it is time for the second poll. Uh, if I ask uh, Mr. Khalid to put our second poll, which is a very interesting poll, and we're eager to know uh, the attendance. Now, post-DVT treatment, would you recommend the patient to put on compression for prophylaxis of post thrombotic syndrome? If yes, for how long? So you have option number one, no, option number two, six to eight weeks, or option number three, four to six months. Please submit your question and it will take around 45 seconds for assessing. And after that, we will show uh, the uh, result to everyone uh, to show the Egyptian and Russian vascular uh, philobologists what do they feel about this. And I'm very interested to see how much percentage option number three, which I think will be dominating. And the mic is back to you, Professor Ayman. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much. Uh, you can I was announce right. the, yes. I was right, 77% uh, is option three. And it will be interesting for candidates for one and two, why they don't prolong the treatment, especially in uh, post-DVT management. Uh, so Mike is back to you, Professor Aim. Thank you, Omar. And um, uh, I am honored to introduce uh, Dr. Roman Trojineski. Uh, from International Institute of Healthcare and uh, Additional Education Research Institute of Clinical Medicine. He's a member of National College of Philology of Russia. Uh, Dr. Roman is going to discuss cumulative reflux, uh, 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 reflux uh, source, uh, not a single vein. Please, uh, Dr. Uh, Roman. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Give me a sec. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Do you see my presentation now? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I appreciate the organization committee for the invitation, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, today, I want to uh, discuss an interesting issue that might have seemed simple only at first glance. The issue is a source of venous reflux. Um, it is my disclosure. Modern conception of a reflux source includes several postulates. First, source of reflux is considered as a feeding vein located at the most proximal part of reflux conduit, and it could be saphenofemoral junction, pelvic veins, thigh perforating veins, etc. Second, an elimination of reflux source is a crucial and mandatory task of surgery that prevents a varicose vein recurrence. It's well known that in case of competent terminal valve, venous reflux is filled from some tributaries at the saphenofemoral junction area. But after halligation with dissection and ligation of the tributaries at the junction area, venous reflux does not disappear in the part of great saphenous vein located below. Zolman and co-authors surmised that in case of competent both, 
terminal and preterminal valves. Some tributaries located just beneath preterminal valves could feed venous reflux. In turn, our own experience tells us that if we want to track a feeding source carefully, we should follow upstream along the retrograde flow. However, sometimes a feeding vein could not be found at all, especially in early disease stages. And on the one hand, the studies and our own experience tell us that it might be, but on the other hand, uh, the absence of feeding source contradicts to the uh, energy and uh, mass conservation laws. That is, it's physically impossible. Uh, whenever I get this kind of dichotomy, I remember a quote of Brian Greene, who is a famous physicist. Human experience is often a misleading guide to the true nature of reality. In my perspective, it means that we don't have to blindly rely on our own experience because uh, we don't see a whole picture and only specially designed experiments could either uh, approve or disapprove our guesses. Thereby, we decided to do the experimental study. We suggest that, uh, we suppose, sorry, we suppose that great, uh, tributaries uh, uh, of great saponous vein um, contrib uh, contributes to the reflux volume, and it can be in addition to the reflux from some incompetent sources. We aim to compare simultaneously measured reflux volume in the upper and lower great saponous vein segments in a site. We performed prospective single center experimental study. Patients who had an incompetence of only great saponous vein with varicose vein presented only below any level were included in the study. Initially, we measured a cross-section area of great saponous vein at two points. The upper point was at five centimeters below saphenophemoral junction. The distal point was five centimeters uh, above knee level. Then we carefully measured a cross-section area of each tributary joint to great saphenous vein between the points of measurement. Then uh, we took a measurement of reflux flow parameters, such as time average linear velocity and reflux time at both points simultaneously by two researchers and two identical ultrasound machines. We used the distal calf compression and decompression as a provoking maneuver. Finally, we calculated a uh, total cross-section area of all the tributaries located between points as an arithmetic sum. Uh, reflux volume was calculated for each point. Uh, then we estimated the difference in absolute values of reflux volume and its relative changing. Okay, let's take a look at the results. There was no difference in cross-section area between uh, the upper and lower points. Meanwhile, reflux volume was significantly higher in the lower points. Uh, we know that uh, volume of flow is a product of area, velocity, and time. So the difference in volume of flow could be due to the difference in either area or velocity or time. Since the cross-section area and reflux time were almost equal at both points, the difference in reflux volume was owing to the difference in time average velocity. Moreover, time average velocity was the most impacting factor on delta reflux volume. The absolute value of delta reflux volume was almost 8 milliliters, and its relative changing was uh, 65%. Uh, there were only competent tributaries between the points and their total cross-section area was two times less than cross-section area of grid saponous vein itself. So we can uh, do the following conclusions. Reflux volume increases caudally from uh, along grid saponous vein in a side. Second, the increment of reflux volume in a distal direction is the result of inflow from competent tributaries. Uh, so, the so-called uh, Venturi effect could be at the root of the study results. Uh, let's reflect on it. Uh, during the reflux, 
average velocity of a retrograde flow is considerably higher than average velocity in any of the tributaries. Given the energy conservation law, we know if a velocity increases, uh, a static pressure decreases. Uh, hence, the static pressure in great siphonous vein is less than static pressure in any of the tributaries. Therefore, blood shifts into great siphonous vein from the branches. As I mentioned above, we don't see this whole picture uh, because of the ultrasound examination is usually performed by a single practitioner with one probe only and a particular and in particular part of reflux condom during a uh, provoking maneuver. And if and if we want to see the whole picture, we should be like Shiva. The tributary is located between points was the reason for considerable reflux volume increasing. We got an additional eight milliliters of blood from their total cross-section area of 0 0.16 square centimeters. In turn, 13 milliliters of blood passed through the upper point, but there are several constant tributaries above this point as well. As uh, and the total cross-section area of them was 0 0.25 square centimeters in the study. So we can surmise that a uh, significant part of these 13 uh, milliliters of blood uh, was received from these tributaries and that Safena femoral junction gave even less this, is, this amount of blood. A total cross-section area of all the tributaries located between the junction and the lower point was significantly higher than a cross-section area of great saphenous vein itself. We suppose that uh, the major part of reflux volume comes from the tributaries and not from the junction only. It was confirmed when we stratified the sample into two groups. The first group, it was uh, incompetent osteal valve, and the second group was competent osteal valve, including 37 and 33 lower limbs, respectively. Delta reflux volume was significantly high in the first group, despite the fact that a total cross-section area of the tributaries between points was equal. Again, the reason was because time average velocity was significantly higher in the first group. So, as a discussion, we offered to consider uh, a reflux source as an aggregate of all feeding veins joined with reflux conduit, either competent or incompetent, instead of considering only certain veins as a source. And it is technically impossible to eliminate all of these feeding veins. Uh, in most of the cases, we eliminate uh, reflux conduit only. And moreover, all of these feeding veins exist all the time. And before the reflux emerges, this vein adds blood volume for anterograde flow only and become the source uh, just after reflux arises. And we guess that uh, um, varicose vein recurrence uh, should be just the matter of new reflux conduit emerging. And it's not as a reason of uh, not eliminated reflux source previously. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me finish with uh, another great physicist uh, who said, the great enemy of knowledge is it not ignorance, it is illusion of knowledge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Trojanesky. Congratulations for this very interesting and a very well organized talk. It was great. It is a very nice piece of work. Uh, uh, now I um, ask uh, Dr. Professor Khaldil Kafas, Professor of Radiology and Interventional Radiology, Cairo University, to uh, ask his question and comment. Please, Dr. Khaled. Hello, everybody. I will thank you uh, first uh, here, uh, Dr. Roman, for your very marvelous and nice presentation. I think you have tackled and overlooked areas of uh, patients suffering from varicose veins regarding the diagnosis of the reflux sources. Um, I want to ask about two questions. The first uh, of all, uh, do you uh, use this uh, information you uh, gathered from your presentation 
to guide you to, to avoid ablation of the great saphenous vein or removing the great saphenous vein as a treatment of patient suffering from truncal pericostis because um, if you have, uh, in my opinion, if you ablate the great saphenous vein, you have, you'll abolish all the predicted uh, refluxing sources regarding this. My second question, um, from the diagnostic point of view, uh, is uh, the sonographer have to uh, um, guided by the patient's uh, manifestations or presentation to perform his ultrasound uh, uh, examination of the patient or only follow the uh, uh, standard protocol in examination of the, the patient? Thank you. Thank, thank you for your questions. Excellent questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I think, yes, uh, the good idea, the, may, maybe the main uh, procedure that we uh, have to do is uh, eliminate reflux, the trunk, trunk and uh, varicose uh, tributaries. It's a good idea. Uh, but it, uh, maybe it's a little bit complicated and uh, we don't have any time to discuss uh, Chiva and so on. Uh, but anyway, uh, to eliminate uh, uh, all of reflux conduit, it's a good idea. Uh, and it may be, uh, I sh I'm sure that it is a uh, best uh, what, we, what we have in the moment. Uh, the second, uh, I, uh, I didn't hear uh, exactly what, what, what do you ask? I'm asking about uh, during performing the ultrasound examination of the patient coming suffering from varicose vein. Do you uh, uh, follow a standard protocol in the, the examination or you okay. are guided by, by, by the presentation of the patient? If the patient is presenting by extra axial varicosis only or varicose related to the tongue. Okay, thank you for your questions. Uh, usually, um, I guide it for, uh, uh, for the recommendation, uh, but uh, in, in usually practice, uh, I, sh I should uh, restrict the uh, amount of mind that I uh, to, to do the examination. Uh, and uh, usually, I try to um, discover uh, the saphenofemoral junction, uh, distal, distal part uh, in the in SI, and a uh, uh, distal part in a calf, and uh, what we have, uh, we have uh, all of the all of the trunk uh, incompetence trunk, or we have only segments uh, of segment reflux of uh, this reflux conduit. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roman. I think you have some questions for uh, yes. Dr. Roman. Yes. Yes, we have uh, two interesting opposing questions. The first one from Professor Alexei Nadvikov. He said, according to your data, it does not make sense to perform Shiva procedure in a classic version. And the other question from Professor Hosvik Manjikin. He said, you, your hypothesis is killing Shiva technique. So what do you answer for this? Uh, first of all, uh, I would prefer that uh, it is not hypothesis because we did a measurement uh, the, and this uh, measurement uh, was uh, statistical significant and uh, we have strong physical explanation uh, what we saw and what we see uh, in the patient. Uh, about uh, Chiva, it's maybe it is more complicated questions uh, and uh, um, I think no. Uh, our our uh, data uh, doesn't kill the, the Shiva methodics, uh, and um, I I I would prefer to say to this way that uh, Shiva met Shiva method um, uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a good method uh, when we. Uh, don't have uh, advanced stages of the disease. I would prefer this way uh, at the moment. Uh, another, another explanation, uh, uh, when, if, you, if, you, if, if I uh, would want to uh, explain in the physical point of view, I think it, it would be a little bit uh, complicated and uh, needs uh, more time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Roman. And uh, now it is my turn to introduce my dear uh, friend uh, and uh, my great fellow, and as I always describe him, my safety net. Uh, I would like to introduce 
Professor Mohammed Omar Farouk. Uh, he's a senior consultant of vascular surgery in general organization of teaching hospital and institutes, uh, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, Professor Omar, uh, after he was graduated from Shams University, he uh, extended his training in uh, West Midland uh, vascular rotation in United Kingdom uh, and uh, got uh, his fellowship from the Royal College of England. Uh, Dr. Omar uh, has a vast experience in uh, surgery, of course, and uh, in vascular techniques, especially in uh, EVAR and uh, complicated cases of EVAR. Uh, we shared a lot of the educational uh, programs and uh, we start uh, our work together, let's say, um, more than 15 years ago. Uh, is doing a very good job in teaching and uh, in all modalities and uh, he is a leader of uh, the fellow Egyptian fellowship program and he is also examiner of the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, today he is going to discuss uh, different modalities of exolator in the treatment of plangectasia. Thank you very much for the, for the nice introduction, my dear Professor Ayman, and I will promise I will stick to time. Um, I am very much uh, honored by having such a Russian uh, philobologist um, as an audience for my lecture, because I'm very fascinated and interested with the advances in Russian medicine. So my topic is different modality of the laser treatment of telangiectasia and uh, I promise you my presentation is extremely simple as not complicated. So my learning objective is to demonstrate how to use laser for veins, what is the advantage and disadvantage of each technique. I will summarize just my experience and I will put tips and tricks that I have collected over the last 25 years. So uh, definition, we know that laser is an amplification of a stimulated emission of radiation. We know telangiectasia, this is the picture that we see, which is dilatation of subpapillar plexus up to three or four millimeter. Diagnosis uh, essential that you should have a history. You should have thorough examination. You should have a duplex scan. I prefer to do it by the operator. And there are two machines, which is augmented reality and vein viewer, which I think is mandatory before treating telangiectasia. If you don't have them, uh, I wouldn't advise, because just giving laser to veins that you can see will not give you a good result. So this is very important. And the photo documentation is essential. Uh, you must use DSLR camera, not any camera, not just the mobile. You must have a standard light. I prefer to have a cloud storage and I prefer to use Adobe Lightroom for software analysis of the results. Why this is important? Because it makes a big difference. If the patient have seen what his veins looks like in three or four months ago, because he will get this, and this is in all patients, his response will be quite different. And this is one of the nice article to show, if you don't show them the, how the picture was, you don't get patient satisfaction. So imaging is not a luxury, it's an essential. I use this kind of grading of combination of varicose vein and telangiectasia. We have from one, which is easiest, to the most difficult, which is nine. Each one, you must have a strategy. This is one of the units in Cairo. I was able to convince the hospital manager to buy five types of laser. All of them were profitable. I bought CO2, NDAG, KTP, diode and the argon laser in just one unit and this is quite a big expensive especially for a private hospital in cairo now i wouldn't go into basics of laser um, physiology but i would just describe that you must need a little bit of basics of your tool so you must know the penetration of your laser that is why one of my best tool is ndag you also have to know diode carbon dioxide and ktp and you must know what type of penetration you will get from. Now, the theoretical advantage over sclerotherapy, any sclerotherapy will get extra vasation of our, which makes a little bit of discoloration. You wouldn't get this of laser. Laser have an added value of the skin rejuvenation, 
and suppression of inflammation, which you wouldn't get with the sclerotherapy. So it's a different tool than sclerotherapy. The types of laser I would advise you to select from with vascular indication is CO2, argon, NDA, KTP, copper bromide, and a flash lamp pulse dyed laser. I prefer the NDA and KTP combination. This is my personal preference. I will summarize to you over the next five minutes my experience in a nutshell. Over 10 points, the first point is each type of laser you must adjust your parameter. So whenever you buy a new laser machine like buying a new Ferrari, don't drive it the first time with a high speed. Know what is your tools, what is your parameter. At least it takes a month. This is important first step. Secondly, always, always uh, picture the laser and start by test run. Don't start your first parameter right away. Get lesion, you select to specify, and get two or three parameters and review the result in a couple of weeks' time. You will be surprised how different change in parameters can give you different results. So don't decide before this first test. Now, I use cooling. I think it's a fascinating tool, and we use this kind of gloves filled with colored, uh, with colored uh, ice water to give different color. We give it half an hour before later. I think it's a good idea. If the patient doesn't feel pain, it will usually come again. Now, I have discovered that I usually classify the veins into type 1, 2, 3 according to diameter and type 4 if you have lipodesmatous sclerosis. Well, you need to use the highest fluency to give you a better result. And being a reflux does not affect your result if you have a small vein like type 1. It affects you when you have a bigger vein like type 3. And this is very important for your management. Try to select the type 1 in your patient to get a good result for it and then get more session. Best widely used uh, laser is NDAG, and there are different modes of NDAG, and you can, yeah, you can buy NDAG KTB combination in one laser machine. Number six, as an advice, lipodermatous sclerosis in 60% of my patients, exolaser have beneficial effect. It comes after two months' duration. And this is one of the diseases that you don't really have much to offer other than skin care and antibiotic. So laser here have a unique advance. Now, your best time in getting the result is after three months. So you must be very clear to tell the patient that the result will be after three months, and I will show you the image. Because by the time three months, you will get used to her leg getting better, she wouldn't realize the difference. So this is an important three months is the key. Artificial uh, or augmented reality, I think it's an essential tool if you are going to use laser because it will tell you the feeder vessel. If you cannot decide where is the feeder vessel and close it with laser, you will not have a good result. Now, number nine, always lower the patient's expectation. Any patient comes to me usually having in her mind, not just the legs are getting better, but she will come a beauty queen after having laser. Unless you put a realistic estimate of the result of the laser, usually you run into trouble, and this is very important. Now, the last lesson that I have learned is that not every patient is suitable for laser. So my conclusion is transdermal laser is very powerful tool to a phlebologist it has an FDA, FDA approval since 1998. And um, I would like to say thank you for all the Russian colleagues. That is why is, this is not my handwriting. This is PowerPoint handwriting in Russian to say thank you. And I've tried to get a, a voice uh, translation in Russian over your screen. I hope it did work. And thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Professor Aina. Thank you, Dr. Omar. It was very nice, uh, illustrative and conclusive uh, talk uh, summarizing all the benefits of exolaser. Uh, I think I'm ready for butchering, ready for butchering by question. Yes, uh, I think you'll get uh, many. Let's start by uh, uh, 
Dr. Sergey Vladsov. Uh, he's a member of Council of National College of Philology of Russia. Please, uh, Dr. Vladsov. Hi to all. Uh, I would like to congratulate you with a nice presentation, uh, excellent uh, experience. And uh, what about laser skin burns? Uh, one of the most uh, unpleasant complications of the laser uh, skin burns. How often did you met uh, this complication? Uh, can you say that again, the complication, which one? Hypopigmentation, hyperpigmentation, which one? Skin burns. Skin, skin burns. burns. Burn the trauma. Yes, yes, that's, that's a very good question. Actually, the new, the new laser machine is non-charring laser, which is laser that you cannot burn the skin with. I think the charring happens when you are using too much laser in your first session as a treatment without testing. Uh, I use cooling, I test the vein after a few minutes, and I start with the low end, lowest fluency possible. Um, it happened in my first five years. I usually get to burn in about 1% of my patients as a laser burn. I haven't seen it in the last 20 years because of this technique. Good cooling, start with the lowest parameter of laser, assess after a couple of weeks and decide what to do. I haven't seen it in, in 20 years, but now you can actually purchase laser, which is called non-charring laser, which means laser that could never burn the skin because it gives you a feedback immediately and lower the result of the lower the beam of the laser. But it's a very nice question. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Dr. Robert, I think uh, we have uh, many questions. Uh, I will take the question, Professor Ayman, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll uh, get one from uh, Dr. Uh, Suhail Nagib. He is asking about uh, using the virtual light and uh, the, the viewer. Yes. Uh, when using them, you can see reticular veins. Do you yes. use uh, sclerotherapy before doing laser or you ablate both using laser? Yes, I, I know that you are a big fan of CLAX technique, Professor Ayman, and I know you have very good results with the sclerotherapy. I, I, am, I am not a fan of the sclerotherapy. I'm a big fan of laser. Uh, let us say 90% of my patients with telangiectasia up to 3 millimeter. I usually get a good result with laser alone. But I am starting to be open to CLAX technique. Uh, I hopefully will start it soon. And uh, sclerotherapy in good hands with good experience can add to the value of laser. Okay, the, this, uh, you answered the second question. This is a question from uh, uh, dear friend uh, from Domiat asking about, do you think uh, laser add much to sclerotherapy? Yes, I think, uh, yes, that's a very good question. I think laser is different ball game. Number one, you don't see, you don't get extravasation. Number two, you don't have the needle phobia people are complaining from. Number three, you don't get the amount of intravessel thrombosis with the sclerotherapy if you don't evacuate the blood. Number four and five, there are two beauty about laser beam, which is give you a skin rejuvenation, which is uh, what the plastic surgeon use for the face, and it actually reduces inflammation. So uh, laser uh, offer a lot more than sclerotherapy. I wouldn't say sclerotherapy is not good in good hands with good experience. You can get a good result, and I'm very interested in the new technique which I haven't tried, Glax. I hopefully try it after you, Professor Ayman. Uh, but um, laser is different ball game. Thank you, good answer. Uh, now I think uh, this is the time for the third polling. Yes, third polling, please, Mr. Khalid. And thank you very much, Professor Dennis Borsk. It was your idea and it was a great idea. So the polling, the third polling, post microwave ablation, which type of compression you would apply for better compliance and patient. Bandage is sufficient, graduated compression, garment, 
no need to apply any compression. Uh, again, very interesting the question, and we'll see our dear Egyptian and Russian uh, philobologist with their answer. And the mic is back to you, Professor Ayn. Thank you, Omar. And uh, now it's my turn to introduce my uh, dear friend, uh, Denis Proska, Proska from Russia. And he is uh, the real man for putting this forum to become a uh, real. It was his idea and I like it very much. It was great to share our uh, experience. Uh, Professor Dennis is uh, working in the clinic of philopology of, uh, and laser surgery and the chairman of control uh, commission of the National College of Philopology of Russia. He is going uh, to discuss retrospective study of uh, neurosurgical, neurological damage of after endopenous lasers. A pleasure. Please, Doctor. Uh, before we start, uh, Doctor Omar, uh, you can uh, announce the result of the polling for the start his talk. Yes, the result of the polling was very interesting. The option number two, graduated. Garment was more than 50%, which is uh, quite expected. It was very interesting polling. Thank you very much, Professor Aina. Thank you. And now uh, the mic is yours, Dennis. Okay, do, do you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. I... Oh, okay, sorry. And now? Yes. Okay. So here it is. So yes, thank great. you, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, yes, my uh, my presentation will be about our retrospective study of neurological damage after of saphenous nerves after endovenous laser ablation. It was done with uh, my teacher and my professor uh, Fokin, Alexei Fokin, who is also here with us, uh, and also with our student uh, Maria Shaldina. She is very active. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of this study because it was very easy, but gave us a lot of interesting information. I will show you. But before I start, I want to show you my experience. So uh, it was in 2017. It's our picture with Ayman with this monument of friendship between our countries. And I also had the first experience of sailing. It was really uh, like at this picture, you know. <laughs> I was uh, sailing uh, with the male and uh, it was fantastic experience and thank you for this. So before I start, I want to show also this picture. It's an uh, interact nervous, nervous system extracted uh, by two medical students in 1925. And as I told you, we also have done this uh, study with our student. So uh, the frequency of the saphenous nerve injuries, it's uh, a very uh, different data about it. So from zero to 65% with the stripping and from 0.7 to 36% with uh, endovenous laser of GSV. Uh, and uh, several studies investigate this uh, problem, this issue, but uh, it's not clear how often inter interventions lead to decrease of quality of life, especially after endovenous procedures. Studies uh, have focused separately on uh, active patient compliance, a sharp decrease of quality of life, due to this uh, compliance and also to instrumental assessment on the neurological examination. The aim of our study was to investigate the incidence of symptoms of the saphenous nerve damage after laser uh, of GSV, as well as to determine the influence of these uh, symptoms of patients' quality of life. It was a retrospective single center study. Uh, uh, approximately uh, 120 patients was there and 151 isolated lasers uh, of GSV without microphlebectomy or sclerotherapy. So uh, here is, uh, so about 36% of was men and uh, 60, uh, around uh, approximately 65% uh, were women. 
Here is our laser settings. We use a uh, 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 1470 nanometers laser to mess into Anastasia, automatic pullback traction, uh, needle, 12 centimeters needles, and single ring radial fibers. Average length of uh, veins was 45 centimeters, and the amount of anesthetic about uh, 380 uh, milliliters. So, and average volume of anesthetic per centimeter was approximately 8.5. I need to describe you, uh, explain you our energy settings. This patient was already in another uh, prospective study of um, different settings of laser uh, regimes uh, for, for endovenous laser obliteration. So, and um, here you can see these settings. And from our previous study, we knew that we know that. Uh, in this 5 watt group, we have less uh, damage of venous wall. In 7 watt, uh, bigger, and uh, the biggest uh, damage of venous wall we had in 10 watt group. I, it's quite important, I will explain you later. So we could compare this, uh, uh, these three groups between each other. But uh, in the venous linear damage, uh, linear density was approximately 70 joule per centimeter in all of these groups. So here is distribution of patients by puncture level. Uh, most of them was uh, on upper calf or in the mid calf. Uh, and here, I think you don't see, but uh, total uh, at thigh level, it was 25% uh, and in calf level also about 75%. Uh, here is our survey for patients. So our student uh, called them made, made a phone call and asked them this survey. This survey was completed with our neurologist. So we asked about uh, different uh, feelings, about uh, different feelings of patients and uh, which was, uh, uh, so <laughs> which can give us some information, could give us some information about uh, neurological damage. And also we asked about uh, duration of symptoms, uh, about localizations, and also quality of life. And we had only one important question. Question, do these feelings interfere with your life or do you feel them only when uh, touched and they uh, do not bother you? So it is very important. Uh, here is... Uh, here is a distribution of our uh, of that symptoms, and you can see that uh, 61 in 61 cases we had uh, some uh, feelings of nerve injuries. So it's approximately 40 percent. It's quite a lot, big number, but decreasing of quality of life was only in 4.6 percent. So very very small amount. It's only one of 20 patients. Uh, patients has had this uh, decreasing of quality of life. All of other patients just had these symptoms when they touch their skin, you know, or somewhere wear their clothes or something like this. So in majority of cases, uh, there was no any interference of uh, their life. So, okay, uh, here is the results. And uh, so here is the total, uh, sorry, I will close this. So. Uh, decreasing of quality of life uh, total and so it's a total symptoms and decreasing of quality of life but as I told you it was a retrospective study we uh, called patients in February you know and patients was operated from uh, uh, February, uh, so February which was built before this so for one year so it means that in time of, of the call uh, we had, uh, so symptoms disappear in majority of patients, okay? So, uh, yes, median of the symptoms relief was approximately two months. Here is localizations of symptoms. 13.9% uh, was on the thigh. Sorry, I uh, just a uh, second. Sorry, sorry for this. Uh, Here is the localization of symptoms. 13.9% uh, on the thigh, 7% uh, close to the knee, and 30%, uh, approximately 30% were on the calf. 
so uh, 7.9 percent of patients had symptoms in two or more localizations and here is the result the analysis of puncture level in different parts of thigh or calf didn't show any significant uh, association with damage to saphenous nerves what does it mean the symptoms uh, appeared uh, at the same so on the upper calf or on the uh, lowest calf uh, was exactly the same or in the middle calf it's not important where do you make a puncture on the upper calf or on the middle calf uh, it's more important where you do this on the thigh or on the calf because puncture on the thigh will give you less nerve injuries so and the puncture below the knee significantly increases the risk of nerve injury there were no scientific significant difference depending on the power. As I told you, in that three groups, we, we know that we have different vein wall damage, but we didn't find difference between these three groups with different settings with the neurological damage. And uh, so groups were, uh, with different energy parameters were comparable in the level of puncture of GSV, it's important. And there was no significant relationship between level of puncture on the thigh or calf and the effect of the symptoms or the patient's quality of life. As I told you, it's not important where you do on upper calf or in mid calf. It's more important uh, the thigh or calf level. It will give you difference. From orthocanonary bypass, all of us know that uh, saphenous nerve is going close to the uh, great saphenous vein on the calf. And it's, it's, this is an explanation of our findings, of our results. So uh, no significant correlation of puncture level in different parts of thigh and calf was found in relation with nerve damage, as I told you before. Significant difference between puncture of thigh or calf was present. And no relationship between puncture level and uh, the effect of symptoms of quality of life. So it was the same uh, in all of the, so, it was the same it, again in the mid calf or upper calf and uh, it was uh, better results in the thigh and i want to explain you also the uh, it is one of the last uh, slide of my slide so heat damage what can be a, a reason of nerve damage heat damage high temperature chain with five watts uh, it's an, uh, so we uh, found that it was the same damage in free energy settings what does it mean that five watt could be enough for damage of surround, surrounding nerves? That is why we had similar neurological damage in that all of these three groups. Maybe we don't, we cannot know this exactly. To mess an anesthesia, so we can have a neurological damage with manipulation of needle during to mess. It's also possible. And perivenous inflammation after EVLA. It also could be a reason. We don't exactly know. So here is the three uh, reasons, uh, three mechanisms, which all of them could give us, can give us this uh, neurological damage. So advantages of our study. And the venous laser was not combined uh, with the microphlebectomy or sclerotherapy. We received very valuable information. The feelings of the operating patients, their relationship of these symptoms. It's more important as neurological investigation, I suppose, because we can find with neurological investigation some uh, damage, but what for? <laughs> the main idea for us is what is the feelings of our patients. We are uh, treating patients, not uh, as we told, yes, or, uh, like ultrasound picture or something else. Or, so we're interested of their feelings. It's more important for us. And patients were interviewed by an, an independent person. I didn't ask patients uh, with this survey. My student asked them. As you know, if I asked, if I uh, had asked, if I asked that patients, I would maybe uh, <laughs> ask them another uh, questions to you know to reduce the amount of neurological damage. But it's independent person who did this survey, and it's very important for our results. And disadvantage: it was a retrospective study. And uh, it was remote survey by phone. Yes, it's disadvantages, but anyway, I think that it was very easy study and gives us very interesting information. And also for me, as for surgeon who did all of that 150 uh, procedures.
Conclusion. Symptoms of the saphenous nerves damage after endovenous laser uh, of GSV may occur in 40%, but only 4.6% of cases symptoms uh, uh, reduced quality of life. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, most of them disappeared in uh, approximately two months. Uh, puncture below the knee increases the risk of saphenous nerve damage. Yes, but after our data analysis, we can recommend endovenous laser and also we can recommend the puncture level below the knee because, as I told you, uh, most of these symptoms were not so important for patients and that symptoms which decreased quality of life, uh, all of them disappeared or at least become less. So, and uh, not any serious compliance of patients with it we never had, in spite of just uh, one case of patient with diabetes, and it's uh, only one case for seven and a half thousand of procedures. And it, it is not in this uh, study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dennis. It is very nice presentation and very nice study. Uh, me, myself, uh, I think I have to revise my technique. I really, uh, get a lot of experience. I'll ask you to make another study together. Uh, let's do it for small saphenous vein ablation. I think we can get more data regarding the small saphenous. Let's think about it. Uh, okay. Now I'll ask uh, Professor Amr Abdelrahim, uh, Professor of Vascular Surgery from Cairo University. Uh, he is going to comment and ask uh, his question, please, Dr. Ham. Unmute, unmute your voice, Dr. Ham. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Professor Ayman and Professor Romer for this uh, nice meeting. And uh, it's a very uh, uh, good presentation about the uh, nerve damage during the end venous laser ablation. So uh, to summarize that uh, the uh, problem with the, with the nerve injury is uh, related to the puncture site and below the knee and the uh, tumescence and seizure uh, beside the uh, thermal injury itself. Um, uh, uh, what about the, uh, uh, the duplex mas machine, the resolution of the duplex machine to uh, uh, a little bit delineate or uh, um, uh, show up the uh, the uh, 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 the site of the, the nerve itself, so that we can um, uh, try to avoid by uh, uh, Duke's guidance uh, to avoid this injury. So, if it uh, can be uh, uh, or can add to this study, or can be uh, used uh, as a tool to prevent nerve injury, this is uh, this is the first question. Uh, the second question. Um, uh, 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 to recommend do, doing uh, the uh, laser uh, at the knee level or above and not below the knee, because although the quality of life does not uh, uh, that uh, doesn't change that much, but still bothering the patient and the the patient is, is um, uh, comes to our clinics and say, oh, it's, it's, I have a, a it's, it's a very um, uh, unpleasant sensation and. Uh, I want it. Uh, I want. I want to have my normal sensation back. Although it doesn't affect his quality of life, but it's. It's. I think it's a bothering problem. So, uh, can be uh, like uh, a rule to um, uh, to avoid putting the needle below the knee level. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, very uh, important question. So, uh, to be honest, I saw many times of uh, presentation with imagination of, uh, of uh, saphenous nerve with ultrasound. But uh, to be honest, I, in my practice, I do a lot of procedures and I think it's quite complicated to visualize this saphenous nerve uh, every time. You know, sometimes it's possible to see it very easy, but you know, in majority of cases, I think it's quite complicated to try to visualize this nerve. You know, in my practice, we um, 
treat a lot of patients, you know, uh, every day about 10 patients. And uh, it's uh, like, you know, I just, I think it's uh, very difficult and complicated. But if you can visualize, of course, it's a good opportunity and you can uh, improve your results. And uh, so if it's possible with your ultrasound machine, if you have, if you're well experienced, of course, you need to do this. But uh, it's quite difficult to do in everyday practice, in my opinion. So uh, having said about, um, about uh, puncture level, yes, I agree with you. Sometimes it's not a good feeling, but as I told you in our survey, only one of 20 patients uh, had uh, really uh, not a good feelings, you know, a decreasing of quality of life. And uh, these feelings disappeared with time. Uh, also, I want to tell you that in our hemodynamic opinion, we think that it's better to make ablation uh, from below the knee because in majority of cases, reflux start from above the knee and finish below the knee. That is why we try to ablate the whole GSV on, from, the, uh, from uh, SPS to um, below the knee level. But of course, if you uh, have a lot of complications, you can do a sclerotherapy of the, uh, at the, you know, or make just follow up with this patient. So it's your choice, you know. In my practice, I think so. Uh, it's reasonable to ablate uh, the knee, uh, the saphenous vein from below the knee. Okay, I I always try to do it from the upper calf. But as I show you, it's not an important difference between upper or mid calf. Anyway, you can have the same complication rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, uh, Dr. Omar, you have a question from uh, the attendees? Yes, yes, we have very good question. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dennis, for such a great lecture. Question from Dr. Mohammed Haggag. He said, why you depend on subjective tool like pain and the quality of life rather than nerve study or correlation of both? I beg your pardon. Uh, can you repeat this? I repeat the question again, yes. He's asking why you depend on subjective tools like pain and the quality of life rather than a measurable tool of nerve conduction study or combination of both. Unfortunately, uh, uh, is it written on the? Uh, is it written? It's written okay, Dennis, he is asking why do you use a sub, uh, subjective method in studying the nerve injury rather than objective method like ah. nerve conduction? Okay, okay, because it was just a simple idea. So my student came to me, it's a student from our department, you know, he came to me and asked, what can I investigate? What can I investigate? And I had this idea. It was very simple study. It's just a phone call to patients and ask their feelings. We made this survey and mm -hmm. uh, did this study. At the end, I suppose that we have very important data of the feelings of our patient. To make another measurement, we need to organize prospective study with uh, neurological assessment and you know, so it's uh, difficult to organize, but this, this uh, investigation was organized in a few minutes. And that is why I'm proud of this investigation. You know, it was just a very easy idea. <laughs> That's it. And all of us can have this quite, I suppose that it's quite interesting data, you know, because it's most, more important than is an investigations of neurolo neurological assessment. It's uh, feelings of our patient. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, the mic is back to you, Professor Aim. Okay, thank you, Omar. And uh, I think uh, now we have uh, some uh, time for discussion. And I think we have to give the chance for speakers if they have comment for other speakers. Uh, we have... Uh, some great speakers and some great panelists. The panelists ask now, it's time for speakers to ask. Uh, I may ask uh, Professor Robastov if, if he has a question or a comment for any of the speakers. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ryman. I would like to comment on the last topic uh, presented by Denise Borsuk because nerve injury is uh, really a very important question. But, uh, however, there is one question in chat that uh, uh, this uh, damage is uh, irreversible and how can we uh, scrupify the patients and uh, something like this. But, however, all these, uh, most of these lesions, uh, they are reversible and actually it is not just uh, uh, a lesion of nerve, it's uh, some kind of uh, nerve is coming uh, uh, inside uh, this inflammatory process uh, uh, around the vein and uh, uh, the time is uh, needed uh, to uh, this vein to uh, be resolved uh, to uh, uh, disappear and after this time when the vein is uh, resolved and disappeared, uh, the nerve is uh, coming out from this inflammatory process and all the symptoms uh, uh, disappear and the patient feel a relief. And uh, uh, what is my opinion? Uh, there is uh, two, uh, two uh, points, uh, two issues in this question, because if we are uh, coming uh, from the uh, distal part um, uh, of the reflux uh, below the knee, uh, uh, there is a very good study uh, that showed that uh, uh, if you are uh, trying to uh, uh, assess the vein at the distal point of the reflux, you will have a better VCSS points uh, after the treatment, so you will have uh, better results in the clinical point of view and uh, if you are not uh, if you are afraid of the nerve injury and uh, in any case uh, assess the vein uh, upper the knee in these situations we the VCSS scores will be higher the reduction will be lower and the clinical results uh, will be not uh, uh, so, so good. Uh, that's why, uh, uh, as for me, uh, this nerve injury is uh, not so important and as Denise presented, uh, uh, it is uh, not uh, so important for the patients and the quality of life is not uh, uh, suffering uh, in such cases. Uh, uh, that's why uh, in my practice, I always try uh, uh, to uh, assess at the distal par part of the uh, reflux at the distal point. This is my comment. Thank you. Uh, your point, it was a very nice comment. Uh, now I may ask uh, Dr. Muhammad al uh, do you have a comment or a question for any uh, presentation? Unmute, unmute Dr. Muhammad. Uh, no, thank you for, uh, for, for your efforts. Thank you for all your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, now, I, uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Uh, Trojaneski? Uh, do you have a comment, uh, Dr. Trojaneski? Uh, thank you. I don't have any questions. Everything was fine. Pretty easy to understand. Great. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Dr. Omar, do you have a comment for uh, any presentation? Uh, but not yes. mine. But yes, my... <laughs> it's about uh, your presentation, the microwave ablation in Egypt. It was a great presentation, and you started to become connected with the first one to do a lot in Egypt. So uh, I just want to ask you, what is the difficulty when you start first procedure, when you have two good golden standards worldwide, like laser and radio frequency? Was it difficult? to uh, get it in Egyptian market, difficult to convince patients or convince uh, hospital managers. What was the trip for you to be the first one to do microwave ablation in Egypt? Thank you, Omar. It was a very great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, I started using microwave uh, for the first time when I got a patient with uh, a great vein with diameter about 16 millimeters. That persuaded me uh, if I do it in uh, radio frequency or laser, uh, I may get uh, a less effective technique. So uh, I heard uh, and I know from uh, Mark Whitley, I can use it up to 25 millimeter. That persuades me to use it uh, in the first case, but it was very difficult to convince the patient this is a new technique and uh, he doesn't know about it. Uh, he was preferring to use laser and uh, uh, it was difficult to convince him, but I managed. Uh, now, uh, are you satisfied by uh, my answer? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, a very great answer, yes. Thank you. Now I ask uh, Sergi. 
no surgery uh, already asked. I ask Dennis, do you have uh, a comment or? Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, Ayman, about <laughs> uh, the two, just a, two short question. First is the price of the fiber for microwave in Egypt. So uh, what is the price of the fiber? Is it comparable with uh, the Venus laser? Or is it cheaper or more expensive or radio frequency? What is the price of the fiber in Egypt? Uh, and the second question, it may be a, a benefit of microwave. As I understood, you, uh, these fibers uh, don't have a part which can uh, migrate to the lungs. Is it clear? Is it, yes. So yeah. it could be a benefit, you know, because all of us afraid of this migration to lungs. Uh, so I have two questions, the price and am I right with this uh, constructive uh, construction of the fiber? I know Thank the fees of, uh, fees of Professor Ayman are very high. It's a lot more than the laser, the fiber and microwave <laughs> combined. So you can answer the question now, Professor Ayman. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Omar. Uh, the price of the laser fiber, uh, sorry, microwave fiber, is a, a little bit cheaper than uh, laser and uh, radio frequency, a little bit cheaper. Uh, and uh, yes, you, you got a point, uh, this advantage, you can go as close to the femoral vein without uh, the fear of uh, damaging the femoral vein or inducing thrombus of the deep vein. It's much safer than laser, except you have uh, to use a very good uh, laser machine and good laser fiber can do it, but it is much easier and safer in doing and using uh, the microwave. Yes, you shorten uh, uh, the stump. Uh, I'm, I'm yes. I, I was asking that, uh, you know, on the top of the fiber of the Venus laser, we have a glass, glass, you know, glass yes, part. Yes, yes, which yes. can be damaged and migrate to the lungs. Yes. In microwave yes. fiber, do you have this? No, 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 no. So, you have, so it's a, like a complete uh, yes. fiber. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh. It, uh, it is it is not easy to be break either it is more malleable can manage to without fear of interrupting the laser beam uh, it is more malleable uh, now i think uh, me, Dr. i have done yes please sorry for the interruption but uh, i can't agree less with uh, dr omar and all the egyptian uh, propositions that you are one of the pioneers in the field of philology and the key, key, key players of this. Uh, I'm interested in uh, microwave, but I want to ask you about um, the parameters that you use, because as you know, there is worldwide no fixed parameters like laser and like radio frequency to uh, manipulate the, the, the machine. So what's your recommendation about the parameters we can use to, to, to update the beam? Great, we have four parameters. Number one, the temperature. Yes. You have to fix the temperature between uh, 60 and 65. Number okay. two, uh, the rate of withdrawal. We yeah. have to use three to four centimeter uh, per, half a, per uh, half a minute. Uh, number three, uh, the diameter of the vein. We can accommodate up to 25 millimeter vein. Yeah. Uh, uh, number four, the time. The time for each session uh, of ablation, it varies from five to 15 uh, uh, seconds according to the diameter of the vein. All of this automated, you can put the program on the, uh, on the machine and do it. Okay, thank you. The thank four you. main parameters, uh, for echo machine. Uh, I think uh, I have done for uh, the panelists. Uh, now the mic is you uh, with your Omar to ask uh, or if the attendees have more questions. Okay, uh, I will take uh, some question from the attendee to the last presenter, uh, Professor Dennis Bursk. Uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Haydar Aslan, 
uh, he practiced in Turkey, um, using radio frequency is limited to up to 12 millimeter dilated great sufferance vein with the monopolar radio frequency. Um, is effective in dilated veins up to 20 millimeters. So I would just rephrase this question. He said that radio frequency can be used up to 20 millimeter. And this is a question to, to Dennis first for radio frequency so, ablation. Uh, you know, um, we have uh, here a pioneer of radio frequency, uh, Dr. Sergei Belenzov. He is a pioneer of radio frequency in Russia. <laughs> so I think that he ablated uh, the biggest veins, you know, here because in Russia we have very big experience of uh, huge veins. But, you know, I have also a study. I showed it in Brazil uh, and won the first prize there. Uh, it was our experience of treating of veins more than two centimeters of diameter with a laser. So I think the both of this method with radial emission, with radial emission, so it's a closure fast or laser with radial fibers. So you can achieve very good results with veins more than two centimeters because you know in Russia, we have far distance between cities and a lot of people can come to our cities from Siberia or you know from far distance with very complicated advanced stages with big veins. And nowadays we can treat all of them with uh, radio frequency of laser. Never mind. So I think that the diameter is not uh, it's not the reason to do some open surgery nowadays. Okay. Do you like to add a comment, Professor Sergi? Do you like to unmute? Yes. 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 Uh, our own experience is more than uh, two centimeters diameter. Uh, we measure the diameter when patient is standing. But uh, when we treat him, we uh, have supine position. And after two percent anesthesia, uh, the diameter uh, become uh, very small. So big diameter is a, not a problem for us in reasonable uh, limits. For example, uh, 25 or 27 millimeters, it is not a problem for radio frequency and for laser, uh, in my opinion. And is there is a difference between monopolar and bipolar radio frequency? Does there is any clinical differences? Uh, we use radio frequency uh, uh, of uh, American um, producer, uh, Metronic. Okay. Only this kind of radio frequency ablation. And uh, so we uh, uh, don't have experience with another kind of models. Okay. So the mic is back to you, Professor Ayman. Thank you, dear Professor Oman. Uh, now I think uh, we have kept very close to uh, the end of our session. I will ask uh, Professor Shaitakov to conclude our session today. Please, uh, Professor Shaitakov. Thank you very much, my dear friends, and uh, thank you very much for fantastic presentation, for my opinion, and very good questions, uh, very good discussion. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for Covidian, which uh, helped us to organize this first uh, forum. Uh, what we see, in fact, we have many tools today to accurately evaluate and properly treat patients with venous disorders. We have a universally recognized system to name everything and symptom of venous disease. CAP, venous clinical security score, several vein specific questionnaires uh, are very important instruments uh, that help specialists from all over the world to speak the same language of venous medicine, of course. And um, by the 
uh, the way the truth is often beyond our cognition. Uh, and, uh, but who knows, maybe the freedom of choice is the matter of treatment uh, is actually of strength. We don't know yet. So again, uh, congratulations for our speakers uh, and thank you, uh, Siguaris Company. Uh, see you soon and continue our discussion, maybe in the nearest future, maybe in St. Petersburg Venus Forum in the beginning of December. I invite all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shredakov. Uh, sure, we would like to join uh, you in uh, St. Petersburg. It will be a great honor. Uh, before I go, I would like to thank uh, Sigvaris company and uh, our great partner, Prime Partners, uh, for organizing uh, this uh, great webinar. Uh, and I will uh, congratulate my dear friends. I will, uh, excuse me, I will uh, call it by first name because now we are more friendly. Uh, thank you, Alexi. Thank you, Kerr. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Alina. Uh, thank you, Sergi, and thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mohammed Al Mahdawi. Thank you, Omar Faru. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, thank you, Amr. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you all. Uh, I enjoyed your company. I thank all uh, the attendees, uh, attendees for joining us. Uh, thank you, and I will say it. Uh, in Arabic and Russian, shokran and pasibo. Pasibo. Pasibo, yeah. Shokran. <laughs> shokran and had a good evening. See you later. Bye. 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 See you later.